next guest who is waiting backstage. We have Emma Camp, who is with us, and she is going to talk about coral reefs in the Anthropocene. So a quick introduction to Emma. She is a marine bio biogeochemist um, at the University of Technology in Sydney, where she researches and advocates for the world's marine life under threat from environmental and climate change. Emma is also very distinguished. She is a United Nations Young Leader for the Sustainable Development Goals, a National Geographic Explorer, a 2019 Rolex Associate Laureate, and recently she was named a 2020 Time Magazine Next Generation Leader. Emma is one of the founders of the Cor Coral Nurture Program on the Great Barrier Reef, which is a unique program that involves scientists and tour operators to enhance reef biodiversity and promote, this, promote the stewardship of the site. So along with all of her research that Emma conducts, she is also passionate about and a champion for introducing, introducing and retaining women and girls in STEAM, which again is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And she recently was also named as an inaugural Australian Academy of Sciences STEM Women's Game Changer. So without further ado, I am thrilled and excited to bring on board with us, Emma. Welcome to Women Blaze Trails, Emma. Hi, morning. Well, good morning for me. It's it's um, early here in Australia and it's great to great to speak with you. Yes, well, we're excited to have you and I will let you take it away from here and then pop back on um, for some questions at the end. Awesome. Great. Thank you. And I should say, um, so I'm actually on a field trip at the moment. So we're um, finally being able to get up to the to the reef um, with COVID. That hasn't been possible. So it's very exciting. Um, but it's a special field trip for me because it's the first one since becoming a mum. So I have a seven month old baby um, who's kind of a few arm stretches away from me. So and my husband's doing a really good job of keeping him quiet, but he may make an appearance. So I'll, I'll <laughs> we, we would welcome to see him. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, I will get started. Let me just share my screen. Great. Okay. Uh, all right. I think. Can everyone see that okay, Lizzie? Yep, we are all Great. good. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I'm like super excited to talk with everyone today and kind of was trying to think what I wanted to talk about and decided that really all of my research um, fits around this idea of corals in the Anthropocene. So really, that's kind of the period of change where humans are impacting um, coral reefs. But before doing that, I wanted to kind of um, give a bit of context about myself and um, especially growing up in England where there aren't tropical coral reefs. People always ask me how I ended up doing the job that I do. So, um, yeah, the far left there, you'll see kind of a, a young Emma. And um, that was when I was about, I think, about nine years old. And that was the first time I saw a coral reef. And I was really lucky that my parents took me on holiday and I got to see a coral reef. And I was amazed. I, it was like this underwater city, fascinated, loved it. Um, always a passion, but honestly didn't know what a marine biologist was and didn't really think that um, I could ever really get a job doing, um, you know, science or research as I didn't know it exists. And um, that's something, you know, is really important to me is that I feel that you can't be what you can't see. And so that's why a lot of what, what I'm really passionate about is kind of communicating um, not only the threats to our reefs and the research and what we can do as individuals to try and help them, but actually communicating to people what I do um, and to try and, as you mentioned, Lizzie earlier, try and really get more women and girls into science. Um, I do take a bit of a, a sort of convoluted path into science. I had another passion, which was basketball, which is why that middle picture's there. And again, I put this in because, um, you know, people say to me, oh, did you know exactly what you wanted to do? And you got to where you ended up. And I definitely didn't. Um, I had a really kind of bounced around career and um, that finally led me to, to my um, current position. Um, but but what, a, what led me there was actually a lot of um, research opportunities and internships and volunteer positions. So that far right picture with the microscopes and the children, and um, that was volu a volunteer and then uh, a research position that I took in the Cayman Islands. And that really immersed me in sciences and allowed me to experience um, what a marine biologist, I guess, actually could do. And that's where I found my niche and my passion of, of coral reefs. And it's taken me to um, unbelievable places. I was lucky enough to go um, 
to the United Nations for the Climate Summit and um, for a Women in Power uh, event uh, to speak in front of heads of states about why we need more women and girls in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, and importantly, why we need to conserve our oceans. And my research really focuses on um, understanding corals that are naturally more resilient to the stresses that we're predicting under climate change and that's what I'm going to talk a bit more about today and ultimately how we can use that information as well as traditional um, reef management to better manage the corals that we have and as I mentioned at the start I recently became a mum um, and so that's also um, I think another you know really important part of what I do is obviously trying to um, bring in an, a steward of the future and balance that whole um, science and mum life. So when we think of coral reefs, um, we can think of them really as canaries in the coal mines. I'm sure people have heard of that analogy before, but they're really such an important indicator species. They tell us that the environment is changing, um, often that it's changing, unfortunately, at the moment, detrimentally by human impact. And so, you know, that far right tropical, beautiful picture that you can see on the screen is obviously what we imagine and want a coral reef to be. But unfortunately, we're seeing a lot more reef transition to this this degraded area on the left um, and that's because of the impacts that we're having on on our ocean systems. So to really understand um, kind of the research that I'm doing and also the impacts that we as humans are having I think it's really important to actually just understand what a coral reef is. It's super you know intricate and beautiful and as I mentioned as a child when I saw it I just thought it looked like an underwater city. But what's amazing is that the corals reefs are made up of individual corals and they are all different shapes, sizes. You've got plating, branching, boulder corals. But actually that coral itself is a colonial organism made up of, you know, sometimes hundreds of individual polyps um, that are genetically the same as each other and form that big structure. But they're kind of amazing because they're actually like mini, you know, they look, I guess, quite like mini jellyfish. Um, but if we focus in on that tissue, they've got microscopic algae that we can't see with our naked eye, but gives the coral that colour um, that we can see. And the uh, algae photosynthesise and give the coral a lot of the energy that it requires. And in return, the coral gives um, the algae some of the products it needs. And then um, the reef uh, structure is able to be accreted so that that physical hard structure is created by the coral. Um, and then there's also these microorganisms, so viruses, bacteria also form this coral. So when we as scientists are trying to study the impacts of climate change on coral reefs and how some corals are more tolerant than others, it's not that easy because we have to consider all of those different parts of the coral to understand what makes one coral more resilient to another. And I'm sure a lot of people know the importance of coral reefs, but I feel like I have to mention and um, why they're so important. There's support services, so they uh, um, are a habitat for a lot of um, baby fishes and uh, sharks. Um, uh, uh, you know, the coral reefs cover less than 1% of the ocean floor, but harbour um, an estimated 25% of all marine life. Um, they're really important in terms of, you can consider them a modern day medical cabinet. A lot of pharmaceutical compounds are actually found on organisms uh, present on a coral reef. They have huge cultural significance for many um, nations around the world and really important regulatory services. If there's a hurricane or a cyclone, the reef is the first buffer for many coastal areas. So it dissipates that wave energy and helps protect that shoreline. Unfortunately, there are lots of threats to coral reefs and most of them um, are currently um, as a result of human impact. So um, water quality is a really um, big one, uh, especially here in Australia. Um, runoff from the land can really de degrade those coastal areas. Um, over exploitation, again, in other locations, particularly areas such as Indonesia, is still um, a, an issue with things like blast fishing. So they actually use dynamite to, to kind of set, set off and um, all of the fish are killed and rise um, to the surface. But where my real interest in, in is uh, the impacts of climate change. So um, warmer oceans, more acidic oceans and low oxygen, this deadly trio of stresses. And the reason that I focus my research on those is that they're being affected um, 
reefs globally by these three stresses. There's not one area that's really immune from those three stresses, but some areas are, are more impacted than others. Um, and some corals are more resilient than others. And so that's why I really focused in on these three of ocean deoxygenation, warming and ocean acidification. So it, when we think of ocean warming, Everyone sometimes says, you know, I've heard it so many times, oh, but the ocean or the environment, you know, there's natural fluctuations. There is natural fluctuations. But if we look at this time series that you can see at the moment globally for all of the countries, we can see that the anomalies above the average temperature that's experienced is intensifying. We can see that this more reds and oranges coming up on this um, schematic. And what that's showing is that globally, although there are fluctuations, um, up to 2016, we are seeing, um, you know, between uh, one to 1 1.5 um, degree, you know, warming, which is where we're heading and obviously what we've been desperately trying um, to avoid. Then on top of that, for um, ocean acidification and for coral reefs, and you know, don't don't worry if you're not a fan of of graphs. The, the the big one here is that there's that red, yellow, green, and blue trajectory, and basically that's telling us that um, that they're the different kind of. Um, uh, IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change predictions of where we're heading. The point being is that even if we meet the best case scenario, we actually go carbon negative, um, you know, we reduce fossil fuels and become, um, you know, entirely green um, as a society, you'll see that that line, it's still going to, there's still going to be an increase before there's a levelling and a decrease. And, and if we see that, you'll see there's something that says global bleaching events along the bottom. And what that means is that the oceans absorb lots of heat um, and also they um, have their chemistry changed by the absorption of fossil fuels in particular carbon dioxide into the into the water and it's really important the oceans do that if they didn't do that um, conditions would be very different um, on earth because it would be a lot warmer but the problem is that when the oceans absorb that excess heat um, and they have that change in chemistry it has a knock-on effect and we know that even if we were to stop all carbon emissions and fossil fuel emissions today there's going to be at least a decade where the um, environment in the oceans are going to have to re equilibrate to perfect and that's what we're worried about we're worried that actually coral reefs don't have that time to get through this period of environmental change and that's under our best case scenario and unfortunately we're not tracking um, on that trajectory so what else then in the broader picture I guess are, are corals having to contend with so we've also got ocean warming and ocean acidification is we can think of this as kind of like the osteoporosis of the sea so basically that changing um, chemistry by the absorption of carbon dioxide creates a chemical reaction in the ocean that's basically pushing it to be slightly more acidic and have less of the chemical building blocks that things like corals require to make their structure. We're seeing more frequent and severe storm activities, low oxygen levels, and this has a knock-on effect on things like ocean currents. So if we're thinking about larval supply for lots of marine organisms, not just corals, that can be impacted. Um, and with that, we're seeing um, a loss of species. So we are seeing um, extinctions occurring. And scarily for coral reefs, we actually don't know um, enough about all of the species that, that are there for um, particularly high biodiversity areas like the Great Barrier Reef. So we actually could be losing some species that we've never actually discovered. Um, and obviously that has a knock-on effect because if we lose those services, if we lose the important resources such as coral reefs, we're going to see things like environmental refugees um, increase because as I mentioned, reefs are that barrier, they help protect um, the coastline. So there's lots of impacts that unfortunately we're having on, on coral reefs. Um, that not only impact coral reefs but feed back onto us as well. So this schematic here, this image just shows, you know, how quickly this is a, you know, we've got a healthy coral reef, then we've got a bleached reef in the middle. So the bleaching is basically when that microscopic algae that is so important for the coral that I mentioned at the start, under stress, it becomes actually toxic to the coral. It gets expelled from the coral. That's why we say the coral's bleached because it's no longer got the algae that give its colour, I mean, its tissue. And then unfortunately, not always, but unfortunately, many times it will transition really quickly to um, death and then algae grows over that. And that's the far right picture. 
So if we talk about here on the Great Barrier, that's where a lot of my research now focuses, we can see that there's 2016, 27 and 2020, we had um, marine bleaching events. And this is really, um, you know, a monumental event globally, firstly, because these are bleaching events in 2016 and 2017 was a global event. It didn't just happen in the Great Barrier Reef. But why it was so significant here in Australia was that it was the first time that there'd ever been a documented back to back bleaching event. So one in 2016, one in 2017. And what that meant is that it's eroding the capacity of the system to rebuild. If, if you know, we know that corals can bleach and the systems can recover if it's not too severe over, you know, five, six, seven years but if we've had five bleaching events back to you know in in a um sorry three bleaching events in five years we're really eroding the capacity of coral reefs to bounce back from these stressor events and these are just some more pictures of them of the most recent one in 2020 and and the reason that i'm i put this up here is that we have to think about the fact that the great barrier reef for example is the size of italy and um, it's got over 2000 reefs and so we see really varied responses on the far left you can see um, some pictures that was from um, heron island and we can see that there was areas that were entirely bleached you can see aerial footage from march 2020 which again that white area under the water is bleached coral but equally um one of the sites that we work at you can see there was also really healthy coral so it's a really diverse effect um that that climate change is having um through marine heat waves on the coral reefs and so as managers and as scientists it's really challenging we have to understand which area should we invest our resources in to protect why are some corals better able to survive stress than others and this is where my work really um feeds into kind of the sort of management um, of reef systems. So for the Great Barrier Reef, um, there's long-term monitoring that's done. And um, if anyone's interested, they can um, go here. And what's really interesting um, <clears throat> on the Great Barrier Reef is that prior to 2016, there wasn't really a need for active intervention um, from humans in terms of reef management because there you know there hadn't been the severity and the loss of coral cover so quickly um, that we felt that we needed to start thinking beyond traditional management so traditional management is things like marine protected areas and um, where you've got maybe no take zones or no fishing zones now we're moving to a point where we actually need to consider things like reef restoration and actively getting involved with the management and the manipulation of the reef to try and ensure its future so I put this in here. This is a really exciting project that I'm involved in. It actually goes live today and it's called the Great Reef Census. And what's amazing is that anybody anywhere can get involved in this. So people that are physically on the reef um, can take pictures and upload them onto um, the website there. Um, but importantly, if you're watching this and you're you know, in California or Amsterdam or the UK, you can actually go on and help the scientists analyse some of the pictures that have been put up there. And it basically it's going to be the first um, census of the Great Barrier Reef. So, we, and you know, as I said, it's two thousand reefs. Um, it's a lot to try and cover. Um, so, this is a really unique citizen science project that is going to um, actually go live today um, in its second round to try to get that information on the reef. So yeah, what, like kind of convoluting back to, I guess, then this active management and where my research really focuses. So obviously traditional management has been prevention. Let's try and prevent damage um, to the reef. And that's still very much a core focus of a lot of reefs globally. But now we're actually looking at the science of adaption. How are some corals more able to survive than others? And can we use that information to help restore the reef? And so when we think of active um, intervention that, help, that can help that adaption and restoration, there's lots of different things that are being considered. These include things from physically cooling and shading areas of the reef during a stress event to physically trying to stabilise the reef if, it, if it's had um, you know, an impact from hurricanes and storm damage to actually looking at genetically modifying or um, uh, enhancing which members of the coral, say, for example, putting certain algae with that uh, animal coral to help them um, survive. And so my research really focuses on naturally extreme corals that are found in areas like mangrove lagoons. And these corals have a greater capacity to to survive in warmer, acidic, low oxygen conditions because they've always lived there. So I want to understand how they live there, why they live there and how we can use that information. 
Um, so I'm going to go quickly so I don't run out of time here. But the reason that I'm interested in those is that they're natural laboratories. So there's not many places where we can actually consider um, the natural way that corals will survive to warmer, more acidic oceans. Um, and these extreme environments provide that capacity. We can look at their genetics. We can understand how they've adapted to survive there. Why are corals living in these environments that are more warm, more acidic than we're predicting in the next hundred years? So that's that's what I want to understand. I want to understand where these corals and habitats are. So it's a lot of exploration to go and look for these systems. I want to understand the science behind them. So why are these corals able to survive when, as I mentioned, these stresses are actually degrading reefs globally? Um, and then I want to communicate that research um, at a global um, uh, level to try to ensure that reefs are preserved into the future. So I'm going to leave it there to make sure that we've got um, time for some questions um, and yeah I'm really looking forward to hear what people have sent in Lizzie. Amazing thank you so much Emma that was fantastic. The, um, the first question that we have for you is from Berkeley and it's a, a common question often when we speak about animals and plants and whatnot it's what is your favorite type of coral reef? Oh. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be um, well. My fate. I'm gonna get two questions, two responses to that question. I think my favourite coral reef um, is some of the outer reefs in Australia. In terms of just, they still look as close to pristine, I guess, for for currently um, that we could experience. But I'm also a little controversial because of the research I do. So I'm a little bit biased. But I also have um, definitely have a place in my heart for kind of the um, I call them the you know kind of um, the poor cousins of coral reefs, but these corals that live in mangrove lagoons where people never go to because they consider them like yucky waters. And if you're here in Australia, there's crocodiles. So it's definitely, um, it makes it an interesting area to go into. But for me, they're just so fascinating. There's so much that we've got to learn from them through science that they have a special place um, in my heart too. Fantastic. Are those the corals that you're finding in these mangroves and that are kind of these extreme corals? Is there any way that those could be eventually, once you learn a little bit more about them, could they be translocated to other places to restore the reefs on different parts of the Great Barrier Reef or around the world where other reefs are dying? Yeah, look, that's definitely um, part of what we're looking into. So uh, at the beginning, you mentioned the Coral Nurture Programme, and there's just not enough time to speak about that as well while we're here. But that's this um, initiative about actually growing and propagating coral using a um, uh, partnership between tourism and science. And so the idea is that we've got, we're, you know, improving rapidly the capacity to outplant corals at scale, because that's always been the challenge is actually getting enough material out on the reef. And we're hoping that by looking at things like these extreme corals and also corals that naturally um, have survived previous stress events that we can start to tailor which corals we may be outplant at degraded reefs but it's not um, it's not that simple because we just have to make sure that any any intervention we do doesn't have a negative knock-on effect on that ecosystem so we've started to transplant them in a in a kind of controlled scientific um, manner um, but we have to kind of monitor that for uh, for the next kind of couple of years and just check in a kind of controlled way that we don't have a detrimental effect. So people say to me, what if it's a Frankenstein coral that takes over the reef and, you know, everything else dies? Like, you know, we laugh about it, but that's obviously what we want to make sure doesn't happen. Absolutely. There's a, a few examples of that, unfortunately, that yeah, where we have transplanted or translocated things and we thought it was yeah. going to work and unfortunately, yeah. they took over for the detriment. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's always so important to do those studies and the controls ahead of time. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned um, was trying to shade some of the corals. Um, how is that? How do you do that? If the coral reef is so massive in Australia, how do you yeah. actually go out and shade them? So um, I have a small scale with actually physical shade cloth. And that's where like, things like if you've got an area where you're, um, you know, say high value, like ecological source reef, or you've got, um, you know, a nursery set up where you're growing corals, it's quite, you know, relatively easy to shade that area. But there's also research, and this is not research that I, I'm involved in myself, but there are researchers out there that are looking at ways that they can use different um, kind of particulates that could be released into the ocean and actually help reflect some of the light that is coming in and actually aggravates the coral bleaching that would reflect it back out um, 
of the water. So there's lots of different things being considered. But again, it's always that need for R&D that, you know, is is there going to be a detrimental um, impact of adding something like that to the water? So there is a big, big push here in Australia to really kind of try and think outside the box of what can be done to scale a lot of these issues. Because again, it's, you know, if we come up with solutions, how are we going to scale them to a point that they're actually biologically meaningful um, for something like the Great Barrier Reef when it's the size of Italy? And um, that's a real challenge, but that's where people are moving to because that's ultimately where we feel we need to be. Wonderful. That's not what I was thinking you were going to say with the little, <laughs> in, but I love it. <laughs> Very innovative. I'm going to throw up here your um, Twitter and Instagram so that people awesome. can get in touch with you. Um, That'd be great. As well. And then a final question. I know you mentioned um, the Great Reef Census that's going live today that people can help as citizen to scientists. Yeah. I'm definitely going to take a look at that with my students yeah. as well. Um, but I'm wondering if there's anything else that you suggest that people can do from afar before we can travel again and um, come help in person. But anything else that you recommend from a distance to help with these coral reefs in Australia and around the world? Yeah. It's a great, you know, great question. I'm really pleased you asked that. Um, you know, for me, it's just kind of taking that step back and realizing that we're not separate from nature. So I hear it so often that people are like, oh, I'm going to go for a walk in the park. Or I'm going to go on holiday to go and see this amazing, you know, environment. But actually, we're fully immersed in nature. Every thing that we decide to do um, has an impact on the environment and obviously in turn the environment back on us. So everything we do, no matter where we are, if we're in the UK, the US, wherever, is ultimately impacting the climate, is impacting the resources on the planet, which automatically um, is feeding back onto ecosystems such as coral reefs. So I would just say, think about ways you can reduce your footprint on the planet. Really think about, you know, whether it's eating less meat, um, whether or not it's taking more walks. And ultimately, you know, one of the most powerful things we can do is educate ourselves, share that knowledge with others um, and vote um, for the environment. So really just making sure that's central um, in any decisions that you can influence. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Emma. This has been absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, and such a pleasure to have with you. And congratulations on, on your new son. And he thank you. Yeah. The talk. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I'm thinking he might even be asleep. So we'll see. But um, no, thank you so much for to you and Joe for putting this on. It's been um, you know, a great weekend and I'm excited to hear the last the last few talks. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too.